All right. Hello, everybody. Dr. Scott here. Hey, we had uh, technical difficulties with that uh, broadcast, and so uh, I'm redoing it now. So it's going to be uh, so much easier for everybody to hear, and hopefully we have clear signal. You know, I'm here in the Amazon in uh, the rainforests of Ecuador, and uh, so I was asked to uh, to share my story. It's been about a year. And um, as, many, as many of you know, um, I was one of the three leaders uh, in Orlando, Florida, who helped to build one of the world's largest ayahuasca churches called Soul Quest Ayahuasca Church of Mother Earth. And um, I think that we served the plant medicine to over you know 20,000 people, maybe even more. Um, these are you know the individual members of the church over the past five years. And so while I was at Soul Quest, I was a senior minister and I was also uh, ayahuasca facilitator, staff psychologist. And for a brief time, I was also on the board of directors. And uh, so, you know, I've heard um, lots of rumors and speculations over this past year um, about, you know, what happened to Dr. Scott, you know, why I left, you know, what was, uh, you know, what was uh, going on. And it just seems like there's this kind of uh, dark, funky cloud over why I left, you know, this, this mystery. So, um, so not many people really know um, what was and it was a very difficult um you know just people were you know not only confused but you know there it's like i was their their minister i was close and i i i left without saying goodbye and uh, so that kind of bothered some people and i could understand that here and you know like because we were a tribe and suddenly gone and you know i'm really sorry about that I'm going to explain some of the circumstances so that you understand, um, because uh, you know it was uh, it was a pretty uh, it was a pretty uh, uh, challenging time. So you know at that time we were going through you know a federal and a civil litigation, and um, so it was uh, just best that I uh, quietly move on. And, you know, I just want everybody to know that, you know, I love my Soul Quest tribe and I really miss our time together. And, and, um, and I have always wished the very best for, uh, for the Soul Quest community and, and in their path ahead. I, you know, I don't want to cause anybody trouble. And uh, so that's really, you know, why I kept quiet and kind of out of the fray. And, um, you know, when I'm talking about Soul Quest, I'm talking about, you know, the community, you know, the amazing community that we had, the, the, uh, the church members, the, the staff, the volunteers. I mean, amazing. I've never experienced anything quite like that. So, um, so I'm, you know, my big reveal today is really about um, setting the record straight on uh, why I left Soul Quest so quickly and quietly. And I'll tell you, you know, it was under some pretty grave legal circumstances that still to this day are so surreal. And um, so I'll get into explaining the story, how it unfolded. So for, for a lot of you, you'll recall that, you know, at that time, you know, we had been going through uh, the legalization process with the DEA, you know, trying to help uh, legalize ayahuasca in the United States. And, you know, I think that our church had spent probably, you know, a million to two million dollars, you know, on the, uh, on the legal uh, expenses to, um, to, um, uh get legalization so i mean it was a big investment and so you know this uh i the dea you know they're just a really tricky bunch of people and uh you know because for for i don't know maybe about a year i think we were involved in that process they seem to be you know what i'll just call it you know they appeared to be you know all this time they i thought they were sincere but in hindsight and after this whole process you know I, I think that they were pretending um to work with us in developing what 
And what we were led to believe was a pathway to this, um, this gold standard model or this, uh, this template for you know, safe and responsible use of this uh, you know, controlled substance called you know, ayahuasca. And so, you know, we had heard that the, you know, that the DEA had been receiving, you know, lots of these uh, requests for exemptions so that they could uh, start churches legally and uh, dispense medicine legally. And so I know that we kind of uh, <laughs> created this, uh, this backlog for them. And uh, so, uh, you know, this was really for us about collaborating with the United States government to help to you know develop this gold standard model and um you know we had this you know first class medical team at soul quest our medical director was a physician with an experienced you know background in emergency medicine and knew all about the ayahuasca and you know we had an experienced medical staff with licensed paramedics and you know, it, just real professional, you know, intake process, we had screening process, we had, you know, protocols in place for what to do in every situation medically. And so and then we had over 50 uh, integration specialists who were professionally trained and certified by the Being True to You organization. And so these are, you know, the Being True to You organization is the, you know, is the gold standard in psychedelic integration. And so, you know, our people were extremely deep in resources for post-ceremony, you know, support for, you know, for medicine work, which is essential. And we had an extremely well-trained and experienced uh, staff of facilitators and, uh, you know, we're talking about if 20,000 people came through our organization and most of those people were first time ayahuasca drinkers, you know, we had a lot of experience, a lot of lessons learned, a lot of we know what works, we know what doesn't work. And uh, so, you know, that was part of what we were bringing to the table. I mean, we were earnestly providing um, everything that we could to the DEA so that we could create this, you know, this gold model, the gold standard model, this, you know, this uh, template for any new ayahuasca church who was, you know, wanting to come uh, into this uh, arena and um, and dispense the medicine publicly in ceremonies, you know, and so this was the safe, best practice practices, you know, the protocols, if you will, you know, we wanted to have this bar as high as possible. And, uh, and the, the, you know, really clearly uh, defining what the, uh, you know, what the, the manufacturing and the storing and the dispensing and the security of the ayahuasca was, you know, was all about like how to do it. And, um, you know, this was considered by the federal government a controlled substance, an illegal substance. And so we were really working together, we believed, um, in establishing, you know, professional best practices so that this could be, you know, universal. And so, you know, we were led to believe that we're in the process of using our experience and our um, uh, re an exemption process for, you know, developing this template. So, um, and that's what we did. And so, and we had modified some of our procedures as recommended by the DEA, you know, we had installed these security cameras, we had, you know, special room for the storage of the ayahuasca, you know, with the double or triple locks and one person has a key you can't get in without the other person and, you know, like all these, you know, these controls and every single ounce or milliliter of the ayahuasca medicine was, you know, was measured and accounted for and, you know, the waste was always um, uh, accounted for and so quite a you know quite a, a intense process and you know it's like if you're a pharmacy and you're dispensing a controlled substance you know they have protocols rules and that's what the DEA wanted us to do was to develop you know fail safe rules that procedures that you know meant that you know people were you know going to come in off the street and steal the ayahuasca and go out and you know and and risk the and risk harm to the public and so you know we shared everything 
everything with the DEA. You know, I'm talking about, you know, 100%, you know, full, sincere, enthusiastic, cooperative disclosure, you know, clear down to the license plates on cars. You know, I remember reading in a report, you know, one of the license plates off of one of our staff members. And I was just like, I can't believe that cell phone numbers and all that was, you know, they were in there. And so, you know, all the while, you know, we're being led to believe um, throughout this entire process that, you know, that we as individuals um, in the church uh, were, were illegally protected from self-incrimination. I mean, we were told by the, you know, the church lawyers that, uh, you know, that they made some kind of um, advanced agreement or an arrangement, uh, a deal with the DEA that really set the ground rules for all of us to make um, uh, disclosures, honest and full disclosures about administering this, you know, this medicine. And uh, so that it meant that we couldn't be incriminating ourselves by admitting that in, you know, in some way or in any way that we were involved in the importation, the manufacturing and the dispensing of what they considered an illegal controlled substance. And so that's, you know, incriminating. So, um, you know, we consider the ayahuasca um, as, you know, as our church sacrament. So, I mean, this was essential to our survival as a, as a church movement. And, you know, so we wanted to cooperate. I mean, we fully cooperated. And so, you know, I know that uh, personally, I had wanted to um, to help this process of legalization. So, you know, that medicine communities that were all around the country that, you know, they seem to be popping up everywhere, you know, after the, like the Netflix, you know, Unwell series and all that kind of stuff. It, people would come to Soul Quest and, or, you know, have ayahuasca experiences in other, in other retreat centers in other parts of the world. And they would get the calling. They would say, I want to do this. I saw it at Soul Quest or I saw it in other, places and and I want to do that too and so you know that's a that's that's what happens you know a lot of people get the call but in order to do this you know this is done underground and so I don't believe that doing this underground is um, is safe for the public and so without legalization you know those um, medicine communities couldn't get qualified licensed you know medical professionals you know staff you know, licensed therapists that can help them with, you know, quality integration and, you know, the serious issues that can sometimes occur, you know, during the work with the medicine. You know, there are sometimes there's, you know, delayed or, or prolonged or extended reactions to the medicine. And so, you know, this can really, you know, take some skill and professionalism that comes from people with, you know, usually with these, you know, more professional backgrounds. And so to attract this kind of uh, professionalism, you know, we really needed to have um, legalization, I believe. And so, you know, legalization also meant that we could legally conduct clinical research and, you know, trials on, on the medicine and well-being and, you know, depression and before and afters and work with, you know, major universities and medical centers. You know, we had been approached by many of these, you know, uh, facilities, but w- until we're legal, you know, we couldn't, you know, we couldn't do these kinds of legitimate, accepted, um, you know, studies. So, you know, there are so many benefits to legalization. And so we wanted to be a part of, of contributing to that. Um, well, we thought were very positive contributions to public safety. And so then uh, there was this, uh, you know, uh, denial you know, this, uh, the DEA had um, rejected our application for exemption and, um, and stated that it was based on our lack of religious sincerity. And so, you know, they had produced right after that, this uh, uh, 300, two or 300 page court document that was posted online that, you know, they had actually, and I'm paraphrasing, it's my interpretation, but it's pretty close to this. They had basically admitted something to the effect that, you know, although we had this, um, this uh, discussion that took place uh, about an agreement that uh, we would not be incriminating ourselves or anything like that, they said nothing was formalized on paper. 
and that we had um, no uh, really special agreement. So, um, you know, the the rejection, the 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 final determination letter uh, came to us, and um, you know, and, and it stated it had a number of things, but it said primarily it stated that we were denied because of our our lack of religious sincerity. And I'm like, you know, what are you talking about? You know, have you never been to, you know, one of our church services in the Maloka? Or had you never been online to any of our Soul Quest Sunday, you know, uh, services? I mean, it's incredible. You know, I mean, we're deeply Im embedded in the, in the, you know, spirituality and the, you know, the sincerity of, you know, what this does for our, for our, um, spirituality and our, you know, religious sincerity, you know, so, you know, there was a lot of, of, of um, identifying this idea that, you know, we refer to the medicine as the medicine, you know, our sacrament is the medicine. And, you know, I mean, if you look in the historic context, you know, I'm here in the Amazon, you know, with Yachaks or that's Kichwa for um, a medicine man, for uh, a shaman. And they call it medicina. It's the medicine. It's the medicine. Historically, it's been called the medicine. And so we refer to it, talk about sincerity. I mean, we refer to it as the medicine. And to them, they said that we're all about ayahuasca as a medicine as a as a treatment not as a sacrament and you know something to that effect and you know that we were not at all grounded in the um ayahuasca manifesto that was you know what we based our you know church doctrine upon and so i mean we're i mean every time i got up in public i always referred to the ayahuasca manifesto i would quote it you know i would say you know respect is what every other person owes every person or you know this is this is the 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 core of our church and they're saying you know that uh after months and months of interviewing our senior leadership at the church and our staff, you know, that that only one person briefly made mention to uh, to the uh, uh, ayahuasca manifesto. Um, and so hence uh, no religious sincerity and our exemption was denied. Now, you know, folks understand that our church attorneys, you know, like $600 an hour attorneys, you know, like really top of the line. These guys are, you know, skilled professionals. They understand the constitution. They understand, you know, religious freedom laws. They understand, you know, this, this process. And so, you know, gosh, you know, the, uh, the attorneys, um, you know, advise us, you know, like, I think like most good attorneys would advise their clients, you know, to only answer the questions um, that the DEA asks. So, you know, answer question A with answer A, you know, don't go off into, you know, some, you know, tree hugging kumbaya, you know, um, stories of, you know, other stuff. Stay focused, answer specifically what they ask you. And so, you know, their line of questioning um, was almost exclusively uh, directed towards, you know, many, many, many specifics about the SoulQuest Natural Healing Center, which was a completely separate entity that provided, you know, outsourced services for, you know, for SoulQuest. And uh, it's, you know, this uh, line of question, exclusive line of questioning about what are the services? You know, what are they about? You know, what's, you know, what's this integration service? What is all this? You know, what do you, what are the IV therapies for? What is, you know, K laser, you know, class four therapeutic laser? Why are you doing ion cleanses? You know, what are, you know, the, these services and question after question after question about specifics, like, you know, how is it legally structured and all that, all that, all that. And so it was really, you know, amazing that in their rejection letter, they said we had no religious sincerity because not once in this entire time that we were working with the DEA and cooperating fully, did they ever ask us any question about our, you know, our beliefs, you know, our religion, our, you know, our, our ayahuasca manifesto or any of things that had to do with anything that had to do with our church doctrine. 
Zero, nada, nils, nothing. Not one question about our spiritual belief, not even anything remotely close. So, you know, you know, if you know me and you know, you've been involved in any of my integration groups, you know, I can go on and on and on for hours in this, you know, in this topic and, you know, talk until I'm blue in the face. And so, you know, this to me was just bunk. It was just incredible to make these kind of claims. And, you know, so when your attorneys say, only answer the questions that the government asks you and you know you're you're inclined to like listen and follow directions and not go off topic and so you know i feel like in the end that what the dea did is they you know they really tricked us you know they selected very limited types of questions that led to a extremely distorted picture of what we're all about as a church. And then they claim we have no religious sincerity. You know, they, if you only ask one line of questioning and you don't ask this other, and then you, then you completely come up with a, 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 a reason, you know, well, you're not sincere. Well, you never asked us any questions about this. This to me is bunk. It was complete bunk. And so, you know, it was the final determination letter. And then, you know, the uh, the which basically, you know, my attorneys had informed me that after that determination letter came, um, it basically rendered, uh, in my attorney's opinion, that the uh, the operation at SoulQuest had to stop and that it would be considered uh, no longer um, under protection of this process of exemption because we could stay open during the, the, the appeal or the process. And so it basically rendered the operation, in his opinion, as, you know, as an illegal operation and that the original uh, ceased, uh, cease and desist orders still stand. And so, I mean, I'm just going off of, you know, this was my basic recollect, recollection of the events as they unfolded. This is a very confusing time, you know, and, and I had read the, these documents, you know, online that were posted on the, you know, the court um, docu uh, the court dockets, you know, the Prosser or whatever that system is called. You know, I read, you know, this, you know, 300 or two or 300 page report with, you know, all of these uh, exhibits and, you know, every detail of every conversation. And, um, you know, it was, uh, it was, uh, that's where I found out about, uh, hey, we don't have a deal. You know, we talked about it, but, you know, basically uh, no deal, which meant that um, everything that we said could be used against us and we could be incriminated. At least that's what the interpretation was that, you know, that I had. And so that to me was one uh, really um, scary moment of realizing that, you know, we had uh, faith and we trusted these uh, folks from the DEA who were, we thought sincere and working with us. And so we never, ever, ever expected that the DEA would reject our request for exemption. I mean, we were like 99% sure. I mean, they had given us in our, through our attorneys and you know all of the positive indications that everything was going in the right direction. And, uh, and they talked about it in those terms, like, you know, this is where we're going. No clue, no clue that they were up to shenanigans or, you know, I mean, I don't want to be in trouble for, you know, mischaracterizing or accusing the DEA of having an ulterior motive. But, you know, when we put the pieces together, I mean, what kind of good faith is that when they end up saying, well, we didn't have a deal in writing to the court. So, you know, I'm kind of like, Okay, that was a big, you know, pull the rug out from under my feet as far as this whole thing. And then the story just gets, keeps getting more surreal and more perilous for me in this process. And, you know, when I'm talking about me, I'm saying this is also the other people that are at the church as well. But, you know, I'm not responsible for them. I needed to look out for myself in this regard because, you know, it was my butt on the line. And so here's what happened. You know, shortly after that moment, you know, of the 300-page the document or whatever that was being posted, you know, I start getting some disturbing phone calls from some concerned people. You know, I mean, these are people 
that I consider to be, you know, highly respectable, you know, credible, um, you know, some are leaders that are in the, you know, the, the larger, you know, ayahuasca community, they have, you know, legal savvy. And um, so these were people that I trusted. But then I got a call from my attorney, you know, and he had just read that, you know, two or 300 page document, you know, from the DEA. And, um, you know, it was uh, it was the uh, uh, intensity of my attorney that shocked me at first. You know, he said, you know, this is very serious. Do you understand what's happening? And I'm like, no, you know, I'm just like getting ready for, you know, I think we had ceremony coming up, you know, that night. It was like, a, I think on a Friday and I'm like, no, what, you know, and he's explaining to me that I could be getting into some very serious trouble here. And then, um, you know, and then I had this, uh, uh, this other call from this person, you know, my trusted friend, my trusted source, I would call him. And I was being warned of a possible sting operation that could be going down right now. And then I better brace myself and get a defense attorney because, you know, things are going to be happening pretty quickly or they could be happening pretty quickly and that we could all be potentially going to jail. And I'm like, you know, what, you know, what, what? And so, you know, I was told that, you know, that it references in this two or 300 page document with the DEA that now I find out that we have no, you know, any, no uh, evidence of self-incrimination that, you know, there's also these these um, um, exhibits and these uh, reports about it revealing, um, you know, somehow my involvement in arranging for shipments of vine and leaf uh, to the uh, to the Soulquest Church in Orlando, and that you know I could be uh, potentially criminally liable and could be facing up to thirty years in prison or more, and you know I'm like what. You know, I'm like dumbfounded. I'm shocked because, you know, um, in this report, it had, you know, documented that, you know, the DMT, uh, the quantity of DMT that was found in in the uh, recent shipments that had just been, you know, confiscated uh, during a, a raid by FBI agent or I don't know FBI, I mean, federal agents of some division and the it's all in the uh in the deh report who showed up and all that but as i understand it was federal agents it was u.s customs and border control it was you know state sheriffs or or um in local law enforcement and uh you know so all that information's online if i'm misquoting it you know don't sue me you know don't take me to court it's like oops i, I you know i misspoke i'm trying to I don't know, convey this as sincerely as possible. So perhaps, you know, the names are slightly off. Maybe it was federal sheriffs instead of state sheriffs or local sheriffs. I don't know. But at the best of my memory, this is what I what I got. And that, you know, so do the research on your own, find it online. So, you know, as if that were not enough. You know, this person that was calling me was warning me of this possible, you know, uh, sting operation. And saying that, you know, there's a branch of the government and didn't know which one it was. It could be the IRS. It could be, you know, state law enforcement, federal state. Who knows that they didn't have that uh, or they didn't share with me who. They just gave me a warning that something really bad could be going down and that I might get it caught in the middle of some kind of huge, big, you know, uh, sting bust, you know, church drug bust or church, you know, I, I, or just some kind of like, you know, bust. And so, um, you know, I'm just at this point, I'm just unbelievably uh, frightened and intimidated and confused and shocked. And I have no idea what just happened. I mean, this cannot be happening. I mean, I have, this is like, I can't believe this is happening. And so, you know, my attorney, of course, I'm talking to my attorney, you know, my attorney's like, you know, just stop everything that you're doing right there. Stop all your work immediately and, you know, and remove yourself from the church. And so, you know, going on a little bit more about this call, you know, I was told that, that, you know, and I don't know if this is true or not, I'm just being warned by someone I trust. And they're telling me that, you know, there, there's, there's this, there could be this, uh, they thought that there was this criminal inv 
in criminal investigation going on of some kind that just, you know, they were targeting Chris Young, who is one of the, uh, the founders of SoulQuest. And they just advised me to be very, very, very careful. And that, you know, something like this would really hurt my life. You know, going to 30 years in prison is going to hurt my life. And so, you know, I was warned that there was a, um, a small window of, of safety or a, possibly a small window of time that um, I should uh, could extract myself from this um, potential crossfire. And so, um, you know, to hurry up and make a decision fast about, you know, removing myself from the church, getting out. So, you know, evidently this was about the, you know, the government wanting to get Chris Young because, you know, he was the guy that picked the fight with the federal government. And so, you know, <laughs> I was uh, I was told that you know that the government knows everything. They know everything about the you know the church finances and all the bank records, and they knew you know everything that you know, and that Chris was somehow being investigated for you know the possibility of fraud and or criminal activity, and you know I don't know anything about that. You know, it's like, and I didn't know what to believe. And I'm just like, this is getting crazier and crazier by the day. And so, you know, they went, they warned me that they said that, you know, um, since uh, Chris and Verena were still married, that, you know, Verena couldn't uh, be forced to testify against her own husband and that nobody else would know more about the internal workings of the church than me, you know, and, <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, this is, you know, whatever, you know, it's like the, you know, I was even told that, um, and this was where I really started getting uh, a little paranoid or, or extremely nervous. Like I was already, you know, shitting my pants and you know, just in complete, you know, utter, you know, petrification. And, you know, they told me that, you know, hey, don't rule out that there's a strong possibility that, you know, undercover agents um, could be planting, setting me up and planting the illegal drugs on me, you know, like cocaine or something, and then arresting me to, uh, to coerce, coerce me into testifying against the church. You know, we're talking about, you know, this is ultimately about, um, you know, compelling me to help them to bring down one of the world's largest ayahuasca churches. And so, you know, I mean, I'm like, you know, nothing like, some, nothing like, you know, trickery or some, you know, some scheme like that to dissuade, you know, anyone in the future from ever wanting to uh, open a, a, an ayahuasca church legally, you know, in the United States. And so I, you know, I'm like, I, I don't know what to think, but, you know, it could be plausible. I mean, they did it to Timothy Leary, and I'm not saying that I'm a Timothy Leary, but, you know, we hear these stories, and God knows what the government is capable of, and so, you know, I'm from Nebraska. I have never been in trouble with the law a day in my life, and so everything that was happening to me was beyond anything that I'd ever experienced or anything I'd ever imagined, and so under, you know, under advisement, you know, I immediately got a a federal criminal defense attorney, and I was advised to, you know, uh, formally resign from the church, which I did. And, um, you know, and, and again, you know, my attorneys were advising me, and both of them, you know, they were advising me that, you know, according to the government, you know, this uh, church uh, serving ayahuasca is, is now restricted. And, you know, they're restricted from serving, legally serving or protected or whatever that, you know, ayahuasca. In other words, it's outside of, of the law. It's not legal. Um, and I don't know at that moment if uh, they had filed for another appeal, because I think that you're protected and can operate um, under, you know, when you get rejected, it, you take it to a higher court and ask for an exemption or, a, you know, a determination of some kind. Um, so I don't know what the legal term is, but, you know, there's something that, you know, you ask the judge for, uh, you know, some in, 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 you know, involvement, but anyhow, um, I was told it's not happening. So, you know, here I am, um, <laughs> I am like, um, frozen. I don't know what to do. And so, um, it was about that same time that I'm trying to sort this all out and getting the res 
resignation going and uh, and I just happened to receive this phone call, another phone call um, from a colleague of mine that was uh, inviting me to uh, lead ayahuasca integration groups for some, some Russians at this uh, indigenous tribal community in Ecuador called Sachuasi. And so that's how Sachuasi uh, and this uh, experience in Ecuador started. And so, you know, it sounded to me like um, like probably a good option at that moment to, you know, get some space to to step away from, you know, from the church and all this drama. And I had just resigned and uh, my, I loved the church. I loved everything that I was doing with the church. I loved their community and helping so many people, you know, connect and commune with their, you know, with their true selves. I mean, that's what I'm all about. And so, you know, I just lost, you know, my, you know, my church family and, you know, and my relationship with, uh, with Verena and, you know, all of my friends and my, you know, my, my business, you know, I was just like, this is, you know, this was crazy. This was just crazy. So, you know, I, I thought, okay, since my entire world had just been flipped upside down, maybe it's time to go to the Amazon. I mean, let me tell you, I've never thought really about going to the Amazon, you know, the, I always thought spiders and mud and, you know, rivers and jungle and all that. It's like, you know, I thought I was like, I don't want to do that. You know, I, I was really happy with the, um, you know, with the convenience of the medicine in the United States. So it wasn't a dream. It was not on my radar at all. And um, so, you know, I had, I had shared with my attorney that I'd got this invitation and that I was considering leaving the country for this. Uh, I think it was like a, maybe a, a, a maybe a, a, a 15 day exper experience. I, it wasn't really, you know, I didn't really know. I thought, OK, well, maybe I'll go there and, and see how it goes. And but I didn't have this uh, this plan of staying here permanently. And so uh, so. Um, uh, my criminal defense attorney said, you know, if there's a criminal investigation going on and you're a target of this investigation, you definitely cannot leave the country. You know, it's like they're going to arrest you for, you know, at the airport and put you in handcuffs, you know, for fleeing and, uh, you know, something like that. And then I would be a fugitive. And I'm just like going, does this shit get any worse? You know, and so, you know, they uh, they told me that, uh, you know, this is uh, not a good idea. It's in his office and, you know, by on Brickell, you know, those attorneys. And he's pointing out his window. He says, look at that down there. See that building? And I'm like, yeah. And he goes, that's the jail. I said, that's where they'll take you. And, you know, you That's where they're going to put you. And then I'll come get you out. And I'm thinking, holy mother, I am not going to get in trouble. This is not happening. It's like, you're kidding me. It's like, I've never been in trouble. This is, I mean, that's when I lost it. I mean, that is completely when I just cried. <laughs> I was just crying. I was like, I don't know what to do. I don't know what's happening. And I don't want to be in trouble. And, you know, I was really scared, you know, talk about shitting my pants, you know. In time, I got on the horn really quickly, and he just spent hours, you know, working with uh, with the DEA and calling the agents that were, you know, involved in the cases and other contacts that he had in the government, and just really, you know, confirming that, you know, investigations and explaining to them that, hey, you know. My client wants to, you know, travel out of the country and we want to make sure that he's not breaking any laws, you know, that he's not fleeing, you know, uh, that kind of thing. And so we wanted to get confirmation that it was okay for me to fly because I was getting ready to fly like, like in a few days. And so, you know, luckily um, they came back um, with no. And it wasn't, in fact, it was about three weeks 
after, um, you know, I had actually, you know, got on a plane and, you know, went through the security and I'm like sweating bullets, you know, I'm thinking any second now they could be, you know, hauling me into handcuffs and what a, you know, humiliating experience and it would ruin my career and it would just ruin me. And I'm just, this is what I'm walking to the airport with going, okay, um, am I in trouble? I mean, talk about my core fears. You know, it's like my one of my core fears from childhood is that I've done something wrong. I'm I'm in trouble. You know, I'm gonna you know I'm gonna get punished. You know, and here I am like living this out in a drama that is so much bigger than you know. It's like the stuff that you see in movies, and it was happening in my life. And I'm like, I don't want this. This is not. This is not okay. And so you know, they um. It wasn't until about three or four weeks later when I was in Ecuador that you know, that my criminal, uh, federal criminal defense attorney had gotten um, more uh, direct confirmation that in fact, you know, no, not in trouble. I mean, he, he gave them all the information that, you know, my client is traveling, here's where he's going to be, you know, uh, I pledged my full cooperation. If we ever, you know, were required to, you know, be in any kind of legal um, proceedings or this sort of thing to say, hey, you know, um, you know, my client is not a hostile witness or whatever. And so, I mean, my God, you know, this was such a heavy, uh, scary, frightening experience. And so, you know, to all of my friends out there, you know, that at SoulQuest and, you know, that I loved so much, I love so much. And, you know, this was so hard for me. And, you know, I couldn't talk about it. You know, this was one of those things. It's like, you know, with the litigations that were going on with, you know, extracting myself with, you know, this was this huge mess. And so it was just best for me to, you know, back out and uh, and to leave quietly. And so, you know, I was hurt. I mean, this was a really, you know, shocking experience for me, you know, and I'm a person too. you know, all of my spiritual um, skills and resources were, you know, at that moment, they were really challenged. It's like, I am scared to death that I am going to go to jail. And I never, ever thought we were doing anything wrong. I never believed that we were doing anything illegal because I was told by our, you know, fancy attorneys at the church that, you know, that we're protected by the constitution and our religious freedom to, you know, to worship as we please. And that this was a part of what was covered in, you know, in our, in our uh, constitutional rights. And so, you know, I, um, I really, uh, I really feel, Felt like you know the DEA had said this is game over with the final determination. All this other stuff that was just coming to me is like this is this is dangerous. So um, you know we would be at SoulQuest, and you know there would be you know like helicopters from you know they might have been doing you know traffic reports or they might have been you know reporters that are covering stories like maybe there's a you know the sting is about to go down and you know we're thinking like oh my god we're you know the bust is happening we're we're all going to jail this is a raid. I mean, this is how it was in the end. It was just super intense and not knowing, you know, are we in trouble? You know, I mean, like, where is our, where's, what's going to happen? What are they going to do? You know, are they going to come in at, during a, uh, you know, during a, a, a weekend ceremony when we have our, all of our guests that are under the medicine and, and how horrible, you know, if you're under the medicine and, and there's a bus, a raid, you know, it's just like, this is not okay. You know, this is not, you know, uh, our religious freedom. This is not okay. And so all of this became very, you know, it just became very confusing. And um, so this is when, um, you know, I decided to, uh, to take this, uh, this adventure into this uh, beautiful Amazon jungle, you know, and with all that happening, um, you know, I immediately started working deep into the medicine and, you know, I did, I did like 11, uh, ayahuasca ceremonies, like in a very short period of time and, and, you know, lots of mushrooms. I have so much respect for the, uh, ongos, as they call them, mushroom, the psilocybin here. Um, and you know, the Wachuma, the San Pedro and the Guanto is just, uh, about a hundred times stronger than ayahuasca. You know, I mean, that's the medicine work that I did to, to, to move through this and to, you know, to find my grounding and to get back on my feet. And so, you know, this is what was going on. Um, 
and it's just not it's just not right it's just not safe you know it could be it could be something that could prejudice a jury and you know we've got cases that are going to trial their own mind based on the facts i'm not trying to hurt anybody you know i love so quest you know i love my you know work with this medicine you know it's a deep part of my core now and so you know i'm here in this beautiful country where ayahuasca and the plant medicines and the indigenous people of the jungle are considered national treasures i mean we're not um scared here that we're going to get busted you know it's not like that uh you know we've got yachaks which is the quichua word for shaman you know there are 50 generations deep in their lineage and so these folks you know have a community a tribal community here that you know that administers the medicine in the in the way that it's been done you know in the place where the medicine came from and so, you know, from where it came, you know, not to end a sentence with a preposition, but the idea is, you know, I found here um, what, you know, what is now my new home. And so I love it here. And so we're going to be starting um, some integration uh, groups uh, with the plant, me the plant medicine path um, uh, platform. I'm going to be doing uh, Tuesdays at two for integration and jungle integration with Dr. Scott. So be looking for some posts on that. Hopefully we're not gonna have the, the, the technology, uh, you know, tech difficulties that we had yesterday, but I do hope that, you know, that uh, we have connections, you know, this is the jungle, you know, it's an amazing place. And, you know, we spent, you know, thousands of dollars getting high speed internet here. And uh, most of the time it works, but, you know, things happen and sometimes you know the the weather is bad and or or you know worse there's uh, an accident and somebody hits a, a, a has a car accident and, he, and knocks down a one of the telephone poles and then our electricity is out and so no wi-fi no electricity and that means also no water you know in our water filtration system and you know all that stuff but you know we'll talk about those things in future you know in the future we're going to be starting back with our uh sunday uh church services which i just was so excited to get that invitation and we're you know with our a team that we had on our uh sundays our sunday services it's going to be psychedelic sundays with dr scott and uh the church of the sacred plants and so um you know tune in for that we've got you know all these great people that were with us before we're this is going to be an evolution of what we started and you know onward and upward um every week and so you know we want to continue to or i want to continue to connect with you and i it's i feel like it's it's safe now and i know the rules of what i can and cannot talk about I want to make sure that I don't violate any laws or any rules and this legal stuff is, you know, if any of you have ever been involved with legal actions, you never know it's like it's a it's a whole nother game. And so I want to play this game, um, honestly, and with integrity and follow the rules, you know, I'm not looking to uh, hurt or harm anyone. And so um, I'm about the my father's business, as I say, you know, or the madre's business in this this regard. And I want to keep um, and keep bringing the uh, the uh, the positivity and the the culture and the uh, the incredible wisdom that comes from this work with the plant medicine to uh, to people that are on this path. And so um, thank you for for listening and for um, reconnecting. I got so many messages from people and, you know, it just uh, um, just so touched to uh, to know that my um, my place in the community is was was well received and, and had value. And, um, you know, it was it was like uh, it felt like a divorce. You know, I was like. Uh, shut out you know if you've ever gone through divorce you know suddenly your in-laws are not allowed to talk to you or you're not allowed to talk to them or something you know because of loyalties and this sort of thing and I certainly experienced that um, at SoulQuest and that hurt me deeply and I understand you know I mean it happened on both sides I couldn't talk and so you know we're moving forward parameters 
bless you. And uh, remember that, you know, this world is not complete without each and every one of you show it up as the very highest versions of yourself. So, uh, you know, do the work. Each other home. So I can't wait to see you again. And uh, so God bless and uh, aho.